Good evening. Uh, welcome to the latest webinar of the Adam Smith Institute. Um, tonight we are very privileged to, to welcome Dr. Rainer Zettelman, uh, who's written uh, 23 books. He holds uh, doctorates in history and sociology, and he's worked in uh, book publishing and the newspaper industry. Uh, he founded his own company uh, 20 years ago, and today is a widely respected uh, analyst and commentator on capitalism and the wealth creating process. Now, uh, while we work on getting uh, Rainer online, I will point out that his latest book is 
the rich in public opinion, uh, which e examines attitudes to the rich in various countries. Uh, previously, uh, Dr. Zittelman has written um, Dare to be different and grow rich about the entrepreneurs and those who went against the grain and made it against the odds. He's written uh, The Power of Capitalism. I'm not going to go through all 23 of his books. I will suffice, I will content myself with saying, Welcome, Dr. Zettelman. It's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight. Hi, thank uh, you. Um, the format of this is I'm going to ask you a few questions, and uh, once uh, we've got into it, we're going to take questions from some of the people following this this live. So uh, let, let, let's get um, uh, straight on, to, on on with it. Look, um, as I pointed out, you've written several books about uh, rich and successful people. Uh, can you say what is it about rich and successful people that interests you? Yes, I think there are so many people who want to grow rich and want to be successful, but science, academic research has so very little to say as about it. I found that it is uh, easier to find a doctoral dissertation about the heartbeat of a pig during a 100 meter race or about a laugh life of rare insects uh, as to find something about how to get rich. And so I wrote my second doctoral dissertation uh, thesis about uh, the psychology of uh, wealthy people, uh, about their personality traits. And then I think there's another point. It's uh, I found that there's almost nothing about prejudice and stereotypes against wealthy people. This was the uh, latest book, The Rich in Public Opinion. There are thousands of books, Prejudice Against, uh, against uh, Gay People, Against Black People, Against Women, even Against Overweight People, Against Poor People, but there was not one book, Prejudice Against Rich People, and I think there are a lot of stereotypes and prejudice, and so this was the reason why <coughs> I, I commissioned a poll in four countries and wrote about in this book. Now then, um, your, your new book, The Rich in Public Opinion, um, it's about what people in different countries think about rich people. Now, without going into too much detail, um, how did you set about finding out the different attitudes people have about the rich in different countries? Yes, uh, uh, I, I commissioned uh, a poll by uh, Ipsos uh, Mori, that is a, a very respected uh, poll research mm -hmm. institute. And uh, we had dozens of questions in these four countries in the United States, France, UK, and Germany. And um, in the end, we saw that there were two, two different groups. We called them the envious and the non envious people. I, I give you only three examples for question to show you uh, only uh, example. There was, for example, one uh, statement uh, that represented uh, to the interviews. When I hear about a millionaire who made a risky business decision and lost a lot of money because of it, I think it serves him right. What do you think about this? Or another question, I would favor drastically reducing manager salaries and redistributing the money more evenly among the employees, even if that would mean that the employees would get only a few more pounds or dollars per month. And the last one, I think it would be fair to increase taxes substantially for millionaires even if I would not benefit from it personally. And you see, uh, there are a lot of definitions about envy and I have a very narrow definition. My definition is you don't want to close the gap between you and rich and successful people that you improve your own situation. But for you, it's much more imp important for envious people to make life worse for the rich people, even if you don't benefit from it. And so uh, we had this dozens of questions and then we had this three different uh, groups, the envious, non-envious, and then there was a group in the middle, we called them the, the ambivalent. Now, um, following on from that, um, it, it does the attitude of um, the Anglo-American people, uh, the Anglosphere, uh, does it differ very much from the average attitude of people in continental Europe? Uh, ab absolutely. Um, uh, I, can, uh, I can tell you exactly because we calculated something that we <coughs> called the social envy coefficient. And this means the ratio between envious and non-envious people in a country. For example, if it is one, it would mean that we have as many envious as non-envious 
people. This is, for example, in Germany. We had most envious people in France. To make it easier, the higher the number, the more envious people you find in a country. In France, it was 1.21. In Germany, 1.97. And then was uh, the United States with uh, 0 0.42 and UK with 0 0.37. And in uh, uh, United States and UK, it was almost uh, identical. And uh, uh, so you see that, that you, you British people and uh, Americans have much more in common as you have with uh, uh, people in uh, continental Europe, like especially French people or, or German people. And, and both of us more, more tolerant and more accepting of, of uh shall we say the right of people to to, to become wealthy I'm yes sorry. yes <laughs> yeah, yes but i have to but i have to add something what is very important um it's true general for united states but there's a huge difference between age groups in united states so with uh it's only true for older americans for young americans they are very very anti-rich anti and very envious. They have a very, very negative attitude toward uh, rich people. There's a big difference between the generations. Yeah. I say, I'll mm -hmm. tell you only one example, only one question. We had one statement. Uh, we confronted the interviews with the statement, uh, rich people are good in making money, but they are usually no decent people. And for example, uh, for young people under 30, 40% 40, 40 agreed and only 23% disagreed. From older people, it was the opposite in the United States, only 15% 15, 15 agreed and 50% disagreed. And so it was with all other questions. So with, mm -hmm. uh, and, and this difference between the generations, it was not in uh, UK, and in Germany and France, if there was a difference, it was the other way around. So it means that young people were a little bit more positive to rich people than the older people. It's only the United States. Now, do you think the media have a, have a big role to play? I mean, it, 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 in determining what people think about wealthy people, uh, how significant is, uh, is the attitude that the media, particularly the print media, play? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, there's uh, the book uh, to to tell you to <coughs> the audience has three uh, parts, and one part is about the the media, an in-depth analysis uh, of media, print media, like newspaper. But uh, as well, this was a very interesting chapter for me: uh, how rich people are portrayed in Hollywood movies. There's one chapter, and we analyzed uh, uh, more than 500 uh, Hollywood movies. Uh, 43 a more in-depth uh, analysis and the result was that rich people are portrayed in a very uh, negative way with uh, as people who are intelligent on the one hand but uh, on the other hand with a uh, bad uh, bad uh, moral and so i think media have an influence but i think this is not the only reason i think even without media you would have uh, the phenomenon of uh, envy and uh, st negative stereotypes against rich people. Uh, media make this uh, a strong or give it a direction maybe, but I think this is not the, the, the only reason. I think it, it would be without media. In, in Hollywood movies, uh, rich people make very good villains. I'm completely captivated by them. And uh, I, I suppose uh, it, it's um, many people <coughs> portrayed as, as villains in Hollywood movies actually have people aspiring to be like them, notably Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, who was supposed to be a bad guy. But all of the young people started wearing red braces and trying to emulate Gordon Gecko. So sometimes it misfires. May I just uh, pause for a moment? Can I just remind people of the title of this book, uh, The Rich in Public Opinion? It's on Amazon, I take it, yes? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Maybe, by the way, I, I tell you a funny thing, by, by the way. I had an interview with a leftist uh, a journalist in Germany, but I, I liked him and he liked me. And in the end of the interview, he said to me, Mr. Zittmann, please be honest for, for, for a moment. Let's tell us the truth. I think the super rich people are exactly as we know from this James Bond movies. They want yeah. all the power in the world. And then I asked him, <laughs> only please, one question. How many super rich people do you know in person? He said, I don't know one. And so you see, there's a difference between you and me because I wrote my second doctoral dissertation about rich people and I know a lot of them in person and you know them from the Hollywood movies. There's a difference between you and me. Now, look, um, 
I was speaking now about the UK, where it, it seems very much true that people don't mind footballers and pop stars uh, commanding high salaries, but they're less happy about when this happens to business executives. What, why, why do you think this happens? I, I don't know um, whether it's 100% uh, true. Yes, I think you are right. Uh, we had one question in our book. It was, who do you think deserves to be rich? And we had different groups. And there are more people who think that, uh, uh, for example, uh, football players or uh, uh, sportsmen uh, deserve to be rich. Because maybe it's, it's easier to see what they are doing. They don't understand what yeah. the CEO of a, a company does. But uh, what was very funny, if we look only to the group of the envious people, they thought that lottery players deserve to be rich. And I think this is a, a very interesting thing because on the one hand, they say the CEO, the managers, they don't work long and hard enough to, uh, to earn their money. But on the other hand, they, they tell you lottery player, uh, they deserve to be rich. And I have an explanation for this uh, because uh, you know, with lottery, it's only luck. And luck is a good explanation for people who are not successful because uh, um, if you think that maybe maybe these people are more cre uh, uh, intelligent, more hardworking, or more creative, this is not so good for your self-conscious. But if you can say, oh, he's only lucky, so then everything is okay. You don't have to feel inferior to someone. Indeed. Um, <clears throat> one of the most um, pervasive economic fallacies uh, is uh, called the zero-sum game, uh, in which people suppose that gains by some must necessarily involve losses by others. In other words, I think the supply of wealth is fixed. Uh, I think people think wealth is a zero sum game. Uh, not everyone, but, but large numbers assume that those who've gained it must have involved losses to some other people. Do you think that's part of the explanation why the rich are held in such low esteem? Absolutely. I think this is the core conviction of all socialists is the zero-sum belief that they think uh, the rich are only rich because they have uh, taken uh, take it away from the poor people. Mm -hmm. And we saw it in our research that all this, uh, 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 to, we, we need only one question. We need only the zero-sum question. We had one zero-sum question. If I see how the person answers the zero-sum question, I can predict all the other answers. So this is the core of the conviction. And uh, I, I, I want to add something to the zero-sum uh, belief because I have a lot of discussion with uh, people about this. And I tell them always, uh, only very short, one example to prove it absolutely wrong, you know? In China, 1981, 88% of the Chinese people lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's less than 1%, from 88 to less than 1%. In the same time, the number of billionaires increased so much in China as in no other country of the world. Today, we have so many billionaires in China. Only in, in the United States, we have more. And if zero-sum thinking would be true, you can't explain it. And you can't explain why in the last decades, uh, the number of uh, billionaires worldwide increased from 500 to 2,000. At the same time, the number of uh, poor people uh, was reduced from one to uh, point uh, billion uh, people. So I think it's totally wrong, but you're absolutely right. The zero sum thinking is the absolutely, it's the core conviction of all people who hate uh, rich people and of uh, all envious people and uh, the core conviction of socialist ideology. Yeah, okay. In, in um, <clears throat> your book, um, uh, Dare to be Different and Grow Rich, and of course in um, <clears throat> the wealth elite, where you write about what uh, rich people are like, uh, you look at people who've made it against the odds. Uh, people who, uh, you know, worked hard, run through, uh, basically took the knocks that came along the way, persevered and made it through. I, I spotted a personality pattern emerging from, you know, the rich people you described. Um, what did you determine were the chief character traits that made these people stand out? I think it's very important. I call them non-conformists. People, a lot of them, 
they they even they love it to to swim against the tide or to swim against uh, the stream. They 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 really love it, not only in business. And I think it's logical. If you do the same as everyone else, you can't get super rich with hundreds of millions or even billions. You have to be different. You have to uh, to do things different and to do things different, you have to think different. And so I, I think it's something that a lot of rich people have in common that uh, a lot of them if really enjoy swimming against the stream and there are some, maybe they don't enjoy it, but they don't care about what other people say. And this is, uh, I think, one of the very important, you're right, uh, personality traits uh, from, from rich people. Yeah, um, is there anything we might do <clears throat> within the educational system? Uh, to make it easier for people to develop these character traits. I mean, one gets the impression sometimes that there's conformist pressure against such people. Is there anything we might do within schools or universities to, to, to alleviate that? Yes, I have only, to be honest, I have only one idea because I think <coughs> te teachers can't tell them what they should learn because you know what what is a teacher does a teacher do first he goes to school then he goes to university and then he goes back to school so i think it's not a perfect role model for entrepreneurship but what i would do uh, you should send every week entrepreneurs to school to tell young people about what they did how they founded their company and mm -hmm. so on i now, think this would be Absolutely great, yes. Right, Rainer, should, should that be, um, should, should, I mean, we've had someone called Jamie uh, following us, says, um, should business studies be, be um, you know, a, a fundamental requirement in our curriculum? And, and should we have successful business people going into schools, you know, as part of that, as part of that program? You yes. Think, yeah, obviously, yes. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I think this is very important. I think you, you, uh, it, it wouldn't help if you have it only in the curriculum and you tell the teachers that they should tell people something about uh, economy and entrepreneurship because in the end they will tell them a, a lot of nonsense, I'm, I'm sure. The, the only way is to send the entrepreneurs to, to school uh, every, every week, uh, another entrepreneur uh, who'd, who'd to tell young people how, how he did it. And so this would be great. This would change so much. Hmm. Yeah, in, in the, <clears throat> the power of capitalism, um, you point out that it's done more than any other idea in history to lift people all over the world out of poverty and deprivation. You, you mentioned um, what happened in China when they abandoned uh, socialism, uh, the dramatic uh, lifting of people out of that subsistence. Now, the fact is that many people these days don't actually understand that, and they oppose capitalism. I mean, what's gone wrong? Why, given that the facts are so clear, has the message not got across? What can we do to improve it? I think we have to be a little bit maybe self-critical. Yeah. We, I mean, the advocates of uh, capitalism or maybe libertarian ideas. I met a lot of people who discuss in a very theoretical and abstract way they have always quotes from Hayek and Mises and Milton Friedman and, and I like them them all. It's, it's great. But I think for most of the people it's, it's too much uh, 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 theory. Yes, uh, it's, it's necessary but you have to have much easier messages. Like I try to do it in my book about uh, the, the power of uh, 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 capitalism. Um, we, uh, you know, for example, Ludwig von Mises, he wrote his great book uh, against socialism 100 years ago, and it was great because he showed why socialism can't work. But today we have 100 years later, and we don't have to, the uh, to, 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 to have a theory about it because you only should see what happened in praxis, in uh, reality. And I think one reason is uh, even if you tell people the, the facts and the problem is at school, no one tells them the facts to, to, to tell you this. I have lectures all over the world about this topic. And I ask always young people, for example, whether they have heard about the greatest socialist experiment in history, the so-called Great Leap Forward uh, from Mao Zedong at the end of the 50s, where 45 million people died. And almost no one heard about it at school. Almost no one heard about it at school. And, and I think it's 
very important to tell people about this, but then there's something else. I want to recommend another book, not written by me, but by a colleague of you that, you know, Christian Niemitz, Socialism yes. is a Failed Idea That Never Dies. It's such a great book, and I think you should read both. You should read The Power of Capitalism by me and his book, then you understand everything, because it's always the same story after socialism experiment failed they tell you always no no it wasn't real socialism but mm. next time uh, next time it will uh, it will work yes uh, and, mm. and they and and the problem is what i don't understand maybe to to add this before we come to our next uh, 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 question a problem is um, the people they compare not real life um, examples like I do it in my book, North Korea, South Korea, West Germany, East Germany, China before and after Mao, but they compare a theory in a book with, with uh, real capitalism. And this is like if I would compare your marriage, maybe, for example, with a with a book, with a uh, with a love story in a book, where, where, with a perfect love, and then say, you, your marriage is bad because I compare it here in the book, it's everything is so perfect. And so this is what socialists do always. Not, not to, they mm. don't compare <clears throat> real life. In my book about logical fallacies called How to Win Every Argument, I actually uh, <clears throat> call that comparing apples with pears. They? They, they want you to compare the, the apples of theoretical socialism with the pairs of capitalism as it's been in practice with all its flaws and, yes. and the errors. And so if we're comparing, comparing pure theory with real world practicality. No, we, we either do apples with apples or pairs with pairs. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Now, I, I, <clears throat> I loved your suggestion um, in that um, intellectual class uh, only values intelligence that can be communicated in lectures and in books. And they don't spot the practical intelligence that successful business people have, that they have learned in the real world. Uh, I, I think that's a, a beautiful uh, description of the, of the two types of intelligence. Uh, but the, does it mean that academe, given that they get all of their ideas from lectures and books, is all this going to be left wing? And it's always going to indoctrinate students with false ideas. And it's always going to undervalue the achievements of people who've got real world intelligence. No, not always. You see, if it would be always, there uh, would be a Milton Friedman, uh, Hayek, um, uh, Mises. But I think the majority, for the majority, it's absolutely right. Yes. And it's not only about leftist ideology. Even if you look at right wing uh, intellectuals. You see that uh, very often they are anti-capitalists. It's, it's not only about leftist intellectuals. You find it with mm -hmm. right-wing people as well. And uh, the reason is, I think, because they don't understand this, what we call implicit knowledge, or another word is intuition or gut feeling, what is a result of implicit learning. They understand only what we call explicit learning or academic learning or, or book knowledge. And they think, uh, because this is what they learned, the more books you, you read, the higher you should be in society. Yeah. And if there's someone, maybe it was neighbor at their school who was always bad at school and later read not so many books, maybe he didn't even study. And in the end, he has the bigger house, the nicer car, and what is the, the biggest problem, the prettier girl or women as well. Then they think, oh, capitalism, is wrong something with the market should has to be wrong because if it would be correct i should be there where he is now now i want to take a couple of questions that have come in from uh, our followers uh, one asks us uh, to repeat the name of the book and the author uh, about socialism that you recommended it is of course it is of course christian nemitz and uh, if you look up the website of the institute of economic affairs you'll find Christian Nemitz is there, and the book about socialism, I think, can be bought there. So it's the Institute of Economic Affairs, and the author is Christian Nemitz. Now, here's a question for you, Rena. Uh, so, um, Andrew Sutcliffe asks, uh, do you think it's inevitable in the next uh, decade that either the US or the UK will vote for a real socialist government? Uh, uh, is, uh, they say there's a whole generation of young Westerners uh, growing up, you know, uh, 
they have not learned the hard lessons of what socialism has done in practice. And uh, is it going to happen? And if we're going to stop it, how do we stop it? Yes, a difficult question. Um, I, I think it's the, the problem is bigger in the United States as it is in uh, UK with, with young people. I know as well in UK there are a lot of uh, leftist uh, young people, but uh, I think it's, it's very extreme in the, in the United States. And I think one reason is I, I read a research uh, some weeks ago that uh, there are 12, uh, 12 leftist uh, professors at a university in the United States to only one who's not leftist. And from the assistant professors, it's, it's now 48 to one in the United States. I think if, you know, even in Germany and I think in UK, it's bad you have much more leftist, but it's not so extreme as it is in the United States. I don't know whether it will happen, but, the, but sure, there is a real danger. And I think it will not be socialism exactly in the same way as we knew it in, uh, in the Soviet Union or something like this. But, uh, but what, what you see even today, uh, that we have a tendency everywhere, even in Germany, for example, uh, that, for example, in the energy industry, that it was restructured to a kind of plant economy or the housing industry or now they do it as well in the automotive industry what is very dangerous uh, for for germany because it's very important industry so they and and this is not with the socialist government that we have uh, there but it's with uh, with uh, angela merkel uh, here in in uh, germany and i think there's a real danger and the question is what you can do against it um i I have not such a optimistic view, to be honest. We, we can do something against it, but not, uh, it will not work from one year to the next year, because what we see now is a result of decades uh, that it, it started in the 60s, you know, with Marxist theories at the universities, with uh, what you called uh, Frankfurt School and all this uh, Marcuse uh, Adorno and with these guys. It started there, and I think it starts always with books, with discussion in universities. Later, it goes in the media to the uh, to the political parties, and so. And in the end, it's in the uh, economy and to put all this back, I think the most important thing, we should learn from the leftist people because they did it right. And we should study more thoroughly how they did it. And then we should do it in a, in a, in a similar way. And so, so I think it's so very important what you did do there with the, your Adam Smith Institute and, and other libertarian institute. It starts always with books and the mind and with discussions uh, as we have, but we should be not so theoretical. This is very important. We should have much easier messages and we should be much better with public relation and tell people uh, easy, easy stories. We, I think sometimes you make it too, too complicated. Now, do you think that for young people, um, the appeal of socialism is principally emotional or is it intellectual or is it a mixture of both? If you are young, uh, I, I can say it because I was left, very left wing when I was young. I was a Maoist. I founded a, a Maoist group at my school when I was 13 years old. Yes. And so I, I understand you dream from a perfect uh, society and you want to change uh, the world. And I think it's okay. So, but um, sure, later on in, in life, it changes with a lot of people. But um, if it seems for young people, that we are only like conservative defender of of what what is now of the reality then it's it's very unlikely that we convince them we we have to be more uh with a rebellious uh, spirit even how we look sometimes i see this uh conservative people who defend uh market economy and so and they have their old blue sweet, they've had a belly and then 
you know, as they look, yes, uh, uh, from the firm's impression, young people can't be convinced about them. And I have a lot of lectures at university with young people. I come there with my T-shirt, I love capitalism, my <laughs> T-shirt, and I'm very offense, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not defensive. So, and uh, I, I, I think we have to change something in the way we, uh, we communicate with, uh, with, with the people about our ideas. I just want to say that I have a T-shirt that says, oh, it's um, five years old now. It says neoliberal and proud of it. Yeah, <laughs> good. Contact. Yes, that's I it. sometimes yes. wear that when I'm lecturing. Yes. 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 Um, <clears throat> look, some of the ideas that come from your books, uh, to me, they have echoes of Ayn Rand. Uh, did her outlook have any influence on you? Um, uh, to be honest, I read not so much from her. I, um, I, I think only one book, and I liked it. It was about intellectuals. This uh, this book. Uh, to be honest, I I I'm more. Um, I, I I read some books from all this, uh, you know, uh, libertarian uh, heroes uh, from a little bit from from Hayek and from Milton Friedman. But I was not so much influenced by these ideas. I'm more. A historian. I'm. I um, first. I don't like any kind of utopia, even not a libertarian uh, utopia. I don't like socialist utopia. And, uh, and, and I, I li I'm as a historian. I like more the facts. I look what happened in history, what worked and what not. And um, I would not replace a socialist utopia with a. Um, with a libertarian utopia, because I think every time you want to construct something like a perfect society, in the in the end, uh, the result will be uh, bad for for uh, for people. So maybe I have there a little bit a, a different approach to to others. No, that's uh, that's neoliberal. Uh, you know, let society emerge as a result of the decisions freely made by free peoples. No, this this. Is, there's nothing utopian about that. Look, we've got um, a question here from uh, Linda Nye. Um, she says there's nothing wrong with entrepreneurship, but it should not be confused with simple wealth acquisition. Uh, I think that's a, a good point. Uh, entrepreneurship, um, she says, is a wonderful thing, creative and dynamic. Um, should we, in fact, kind of make a distinction between those who create wealth with new ideas, innovations, uh, bringing products and services that didn't exist before, with those who've acquired wealth by, shall we say, uh, less worthwhile means, perhaps uh, people who've, I, I, I can think of many other ways in which wealth is accumulated, but none of them as admirable as entrepreneurship. Would you agree with that? Look, look at the, uh, you know, the Forbes list of the richest people in the world. And if you look at this Forbes list, uh, most of them are successful entrepreneurs with great ideas. Look at number one. This is Jeff Bezos, great idea, Amazon. Look, Bill Gates, great idea with Microsoft. Look at Serge Brin and Larry Page, great idea with Google. Look at uh, Zuckerberg with no, uh, uh, stop, Facebook. Stop, stop this. Don't leave out Elon Musk, for heaven's sake. <laughs> yes, a, 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 a lot of these people. And if you look, all these people are um, entrepreneurs, with exception, there are some sure they inherited uh, uh, the, the, the wealth, but in this case, then their, their father was an entrepreneur and they uh, continued. But what is very important, what people don't know, sometimes I hear, yes, in former times, it was possible self-made uh, to, to grow rich and to be uh, as an entrepreneur, but today it's very different. It's absolutely wrong. Uh, for United States, there's this Forbes 400 list of the richest people in the world. And they have very interesting research, how many of them were self-made and how many they call it silver spoons or inherited their wealth. Yeah. And 1984, only 48% were self-made, 48%. Today it's 67%. So the contrary is right. What people, people tell us in the past, yes, it was possible today, not no. Today in the internet, and you see all these people I mentioned before, all self-made people. And uh, I think the question was whether there's a difference between entrepreneurship and uh, being rich. I think if you are a successful entrepreneur, 
um, you can't do anything against this to to grow rich yes and if you are not so successful as an entrepreneur you will be not so rich and if you uh, if you fail as an entrepreneur you will not get rich so i think there is a connection be because you can only get rich as an entrepreneur if you if you have a product that is a lot of worth for for a lot of people for for mm -hmm. so many hundreds of millions of people and if you do this uh, automatically you will grow rich I would add something to that. You need a society that allows you to do that, that encourages you, that makes it easy, that doesn't have the regulatory structures in place that prevent you doing that. So to some extent, you need sympathetic institutions. So it's up to us, indeed, to make sure we put pressure on our own governments to get those sympathetic institutions, uh, to get that light regulatory touch that allows people who have those, that entrepreneurial spirit to go ahead and make themselves millionaires. Uh, sure, absolutely. Yes, there are so uh, I know it from Germany. It's it's absolutely crazy. We have uh, so much uh, re regulation and bureaucracy uh, and 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 that that makes uh, people uh, uh, sometimes really difficult. But uh, but uh, haven't said this. Yes, I I don't want to tell young people, oh, it's so bad, we have so many regulation and you have no opportunity. First, you have to change the system and then it can become better for you. This is the story that socialist uh, people, uh, that socialists tell always uh, young people to make them uh, helpless. And, you know, it's, I think it's a very frustrating story. I tell people, sure, there are a lot of problems, yes, but anyway, you, 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 you can do it if you have, uh, you, you can't, you, you you cannot change the external circumstances, but I think much more important than the external circumstances is what your your mindset. And if you have the right mindset, even with difficult external circumstances, regulation mm. and so on, you can make your way. And there are so many uh, examples uh, today where people uh, do it. A lot mm -hmm. in the United States or in, in China. I've, I've also in Shenzhen. Yes, so many young people with this entrepreneurial spirit, uh, and they are so hungry. Everyone want to have success, and everyone want to be rich and entrepreneur. In it's great in China or in South Korea. Asian people are so uh, hungry. And, even there, it's possible, in spite of the fact that there is a communist dictatorship and that this they're, that they have a lot of regulation. But even there, it's possible to have some great stories like Alibaba, founded by Jack Ma, or Tencent, and uh, all these other great stories. Yeah, let's um, can I ask a little bit about your own mindset? Um, you know, we always you, you said you were a Maoist when you were young. Um, what was there a moment, an event, or maybe a book? Uh, I mean, who were the principal influences on you? Uh, or was it simply life itself that persuaded you to, to change your outlook and acquire the, the pro-entrepreneurial, uh, pro-wealth creating mindset? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Sure, it, it doesn't happen from, from one day to the other that uh, one day you're Maoist, next day you wake up and you're libertarian this way. It's a long time. Uh, for me, it was maybe like uh, 10 years. I was very early in my life interested in politics, even with seven years. Yes, I, I started to be, to be very interested in politics. And then with 13 years, I founded this, uh, 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 this uh, group and I gave lectures with 14 years for students about, uh, I read all uh, books from uh, Marx, Engels, uh, Lenin, Stalin, Mao at this uh, time. So uh, I, I, I know all of this. And then um, that it were different. For example, I studied all three volumes uh, from uh, the, the Capital the, from Karl Marx. Yes? And uh, I read as well the critic from uh, Austrian economy like uh, Böhm Barbeck. And I was very confused because uh, I, want, I wanted that Marx is right, but I saw there were some arguments. For me, it was very hard to get against it. And I, I discussed with my you know, other leftist and said, here, this is an argument. This is uh, not easy. And what should we say against it? So, and then happened some, something when I was at university. I made my second, my first doctoral dissertation. Uh, I wrote it about Adolf Hitler's, about his economic views, social ideas. And then I saw that he was much more 
anti-capitalist and socialist than most people think. This is, the book is also in, in uh, English, but uh, uh, it's, it's a pity. You, you can't buy it uh, uh, today. I, I've, I, I have to find something who, who will reprint it because in this book I showed uh, it was the first it was the first in-depth research about Adolf Hitler's worldview, especially in economic and social. And I saw that all these Marxist theories that, uh, you know, fascism is a, a, a mean from a capitalist uh, to defend their power and all this, this is all absolutely wrong. And I think this was very important for me. If, if the book uh, isn't in print and available, um, have you thought of putting it online? Uh, that would enable young people to get access to it. I know you wouldn't make any money out of it, but you know, a little philanthropy here and there doesn't do anyone any harm. <laughs> sure, sure. It's, it's, we're getting young people to understand that Hitler was indeed a socialist, a national uh, socialist. Yeah, yes, uh, no, no, it's, it's not about uh, money. I, I even would uh, pay for this. Uh, their, their boss uh, published, and I, I, if I pay him six thousand pounds or something like this, I, I will get the right. But I'm still looking at this. Is the reason I tell you now. I'm still looking to someone who will publish this. I don't want to earn money with this. I have enough earned enough money with my real estate investments and entrepreneurship. But uh, I, 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 hopefully, if I have this message now, there. Someone said, okay, I have here an idea for this. Excellent. Well, if anyone uh, following this online uh, thinks they might be able to take part in that and perhaps uh, uh, publish this, um, could you get in touch with the Adam Smith Institute? Just put Rainer Zettelman, care of Adam Smith Institute. Uh, look up our address on our website and let's see if anything comes from this. Um, can I ask you a question about your research, Rainer? Because um, a lot of it involves uh, personal interviews, surveys, polls. I mean, you, you interviewed all of the entrepreneurs, you know, had in-depth, lengthy interviews with them. It wasn't, this was probably a doctor, wasn't it? Uh, uh, yes? Yes, this was my oh, okay. second doctor. Uh, yes. why, why did you choose that particular method of collecting data to support your case? It, it's a very idiosyncratic way of doing it. Yes, because as mentioned before, I'm not so fan of of any theories. I'm a fan of uh, facts, yes. Uh, maybe it has something to do with my education as a historian. I always look for facts, 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 and I find them in, in for example, in this uh, uh, interviews or in this polls. And another thing, when I, when I had this interviews with this very rich people, is what's uh, as well very uh, interesting for me as a person to to meet them and to learn something uh, about how how they think not to copy it this is a misunderstanding i always tell people you know there are so many self uh, self help books about how to get rich and so on these people look for easy recipes so here five steps do this this that and then you will grow rich and so on. if you look for something like this please don't buy my books, please don't read my books because you will only be frustrated after you read it. This is only to give people a, a food of thought about themselves, about their own uh, uh, attitude, about their own uh, personality. And this was the same for me. If, if I uh, interviewed this uh, people and I, I learned a lot, uh, uh, always when I write a book, it's important for me to learn, to learn something. Uh, for, for, for myself and then after I learned it I will I like to to teach this to, to other people. Now, Rainer, I don't want to accuse you of being unpatriotic but um, as a German don't you get the impression that you often stray into the empirical approach that characterizes thinking in the English tradition rather than the system building philosophies that are more common in continental thought. Uh, have you strayed, you know, by mistake into the Anglosphere type of thoughts, the, the empirical <laughs> Yes, there was, a, there was a very funny experience I had some months ago. I wrote an essay about uh, the meaning of implicit learning for entrepreneurship. And, you know, there are always uh, people who have to approve or appraisal about it. Yes, and one of them wrote, uh, it seems uh, very much like uh, Anglo-Saxon or American style, the way it's written. And I said, yes, I, I, it's a compliment for me. I, I won't say anything against it. Maybe that's this way. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, 
are there any continental writers that you would recommend uh, people in the English speaking world uh, should be reading? The reason I ask that is we do tend to be very, what's the term, uh, Anglocentric, so to speak. I mean, the, the English speaking world tends to look inward. Uh, are there any continental writers that people in the Anglo Saxon English speaking world should be reading? Are there any you think stand out? Apart from Thomas Piketty, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, if I would recommend one book at the moment, it's not from, uh, I recommended one book, but is, uh, he is German, you know, Christian Niemitz, uh, Socialist of the Fate Idea That oh, yeah. Never Dies. And if I would recommend another one, it's not from a German, but it's from a Chinese uh, 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 professor, and it's a, such a great book. It's the, the title is The Logic of the Market. And the author is Chang Wai. I have it in my list of books uh, by uh, um, uh, the, the end of the Power of Capitalist. And this is a great book to understand what happened in China, because I think it's very, very important for us to understand what happened in China, because a lot of people have a lot of wrong ideas. For example, they think that the success, the economic success is a result of the state, of planned economy, they will tell you. And, and this is wrong. Uh, I, I met this author, I met him in, in Beijing, and he repeated again and again, our economic success was not because of the state, but in spite of the state. And a lot of people don't hmm. understand it. They came I, from, I, sorry. I was say, and to some extent, it, it dates from the partial retreat of the state. The economic success comes from the partial retreat of the state, doesn't Absol it? Absolutely only. They came from 100% state and sure, even today the state has a big influence, but the economic progress was only because they gave, gave they introduced private property, uh, introduced uh, uh, free market principles though in their economy. And I met people there in China and uh, sure they, they speak about Karl Marx and so, but in reality, everyone laughs about Karl Marx. I think Karl Marx has more enthusiastic followers in Germany or uh, American universities than they have in, in China because people laugh about uh, these uh, ideas of Karl Marx. And, and I think it's very important to understand it because I, I, I can tell you why, because it's never happened in history that so many people, eight or 900 million people came out of poverty in such a short time. It never happened before. And then mm -hmm. if, if we, explain it and tell it why it was according to this process that we understand it, uh, introducing private uh, uh, property and free market principles. And then we have very, very strong argument for our case. But if one day um, the, uh, the, the enemies of capitalism use it and they say, oh, you see how important is uh, to for a bigger role of the state. This is what we hear sometimes from European politicians today. They said, oh, we have to learn a little bit in China. In China, the state plays such a big role. And we have, uh, uh, and this is the reason in Germany, a lot of people will tell you, we have to learn something, but they mean that the, the role of the state should be strong. And so I think we should understand, everyone should understand what happened there in China. And this is the reason why my book about capitalism started with the chapter about China. And so uh, I, I learned a lot from this economist, uh, Chang, Chang Wai. Chang, uh, Chang Wai. And, and what was his book called? The, the logic of the market. The if you look in the, the wide, yes? yes, if you look in the, you can find it at Amazon. It's published by Cato as well as my book. Would you, it's, would, it's you like, would you like to do a short review of that for the Adam Smith blog site? Uh, yes, after my uh, eye surgery, if I come back. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. First after uh, eye surgery. Yes, please remind me. I will, I will do it. Yes. Look, you, your views are obviously um, controversial in the sense that anyone who is pro-neoliberal, pro-capitalist these days is regarded as controversial. Have you ever been publicly attacked for your views? I don't, I don't mean physically assaulted. I simply mean by abuse in print or online. You know? Has anyone gone after you in a big way? 
Yes, it happened in the beginning of the 90s because with my book about uh, Hitler, you know what happens always if you have not uh, the leftist ideology, they, they tell you that you are a fascist and you uh, at, at, at whatever. And uh, we have very uh, dangerous leftist people here in uh, Germany. And uh, it was physically, yes, they, for example, they my car was burned. Uh, for really? example, yes, but oh. this happens. Yes, my car. But this happens every day here in Berlin. I think every year, some hundreds of cars from people who are not leftists. Maybe one is a real estate investor. Maybe the other is a right-wing politician. And so, it's some hundreds of cars burned. Now it's usual. Uh, in the media, you can't read about it. It's only the local media. Yes, but it's it's very usual. And for me, it happened uh, very early in 1900. Uh, 92 that they burned my car and th there was also a campaign and it's it's always the same yes they they uh, if you are not left uh, very left wing they call you uh, something like a uh, 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 far right and so and uh, sure it it, uh, it it happened to me but then there there, there were uh, 15 15 years where I was more engaged in uh, business and you know in my entrepreneurship and investment I in this time I uh, I published uh, only articles about uh, real estate investment and so and this time it was not and now I'm only I came back some years four years ago when I when I um, sold my company and now I'm back here in the scene and I see what will happen. Do you have any ambitions you have not yet fulfilled? Sure, absol absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I told you that I sold my company. I don't have to work uh, anymore. And my, uh, for, tw for 20 years in my life, it was very important to make money and to become rich. But it wasn't important before and it's not important today because now I have uh, enough and what is important for me now uh, to to spread this message, yes, to to write these books, and to to have my lectures all over the world. And this is uh, I uh, in, in Germany. It's not in English. There's my uh, autobiography. I published it, and there's a second edition. And the last chapter, the headline is. I want to conquer the world. And this is what I really mean as uh, to conquer the world. What I mean with this everywhere, you know, I mean, you can see, see interviews for the Korea. I have my lectures in China. I'm in the United States. Last year I was six times in the uh, UK. I'm in Switzerland. I'm in Germany. And now I write every week. Uh, I, I write op-ed in French, Le Port, in Italy, in uh, uh, linkist and so and this is what I mean with conquering the world with my books and it's not only about politics and science like this uh, books we spoke about you had this book dare to be different and grow rich and I think it's important that we reach as well people who are not so much interested in in uh, politics otherwise we are only in our own circle yes and i think there are a lot of young people maybe they are not so interested in politics but they 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 are not leftists they in a, in a way emotional maybe they are pro capitalist and you can't reach them they maybe they will not buy my book about capitalism and definitely they will not buy my book about uh, the rich in public opinion but maybe they will read a book uh, like uh, this uh, dare to be different and uh, grow rich and my most important message is that never blame other people for what happens in your life this is very important for me i think this is very important especially for for young people don't blame capital society don't blame your parents don't blame anyone else it's only on you don't see yourself as a victim. I think this is a big problem. Or everyone wants to see this with with this racism debate now. Everyone wants to be a victim in a in a minority with this Me Too movement, with this Black Matter, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. So it's all about being a victim. And I said, 
if if people see themselves as a victim, it makes them helpless. You make them really helpless if you tell them you are a victim, you can't do anything against this. First, you have to change the system, and after the system and change, the situation will improve for you. And I think it's so, and I want to have the, the uh, absolutely different. I'm, everyone is a master of his own, you know, his own fate. And there are so great people, for example, one, who I admire very much, it's Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, yes? It's such a great man, yes? In, in my uh, last book, it's, it's not published in English. I, I look for a publisher. He, yes, published... he, he overcame the odds, yes, which of course is, is what one admires. Um, you, I have to say, um, you, you, these ideas, uh, I, mm, I, Ayn Rand would, would, would have been proud to echo those ideas. It's, it's not up to society, it's not up to the system, it's you yourself. You know, yes. take your future in hand and do something about it. That's very, very brilliant. That's all. Uh, can I ask you, um, we're getting towards the end here. Do you think that capitalism will adapt and survive? Uh, will it reinvent itself to overcome the criticisms that many people currently make? Is capitalism, has it got a future? Um, Benson, I remember very good, we had a dinner one evening in London and you gave me hope because I was a little bit skeptical what happens now all over the world at this time. You know, it's in the contrary what happened in the 80s. In the 80s, we had uh, Maggie Thatcher, we had Ron Craig, we had Deng Xiaoping, then we had the reforms in Sweden, then we had in Germany with Gerhard Schröder. And now it's the other way around, yes? And you said this one thing, there will always be any place in the world there will be maybe only one little country or something and they will have capitalism and they will show that it is successful and i i remember always what you told me about it if you if you analyze what happens uh, what happens today yes you have not so much reason to be uh, optimistic because i think um the financial crisis is not over. We are in the middle of the financial uh, uh, crisis. Uh, some people tell something like it happened in the past, but uh, th 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 this is crazy. It's, uh, you know, if you see this zero interest policy of the, 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 the Federal Reserve and of the European Central Bank and all uh, this, yes, if you would put this away, the zero uh, interest and, uh, and all this quantitative easing policy, yes, then we would get from one day to another in very, very big problems. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, one cause of the, the crisis was too much, too much debt. And now we have more than we had ever before. What, what happened yesterday, yes, here in European Union with always hundreds of billions and billions and billions. And I think it, it will not have a good end. And if something bad happens, they will sell, blame capitalism. They will say, you see, this is capitalism, what, what happened, yes? And so uh, I have to, on my personal mentality is more to be optimist, yes? And so uh, if I wouldn't be an optimist, I wouldn't write my books, I wouldn't have these interviews, I would uh, write my things. But if I have a more cold-hearted analysis of what happens uh, now, I'm more skeptical. But then I think always what you told me at this one dinner, and this gives me hope. Okay, look, uh, we're going to the end. Um, Andrew Sutcliffe has sent us some very helpful information. He says that book, uh, The Logic of the Market by, uh, is it Weying Zhang? Zhang Wei. Zhang Wang. Uh, it's available on a Kindle edition at £6.49 if anyone wants to oh, buy it. So, yes. um, look, I thank you so much. This has been an absolutely brilliant session. You've been very generous with your time. I do hope your, eye your forthcoming eye surgery is successful because we need you around. We need you giving more <laughs> lectures, writing more books. Thank you so much. Now, uh, I thank our followers for coming along and I remind you that we're going to have uh, a webinar next Tuesday. It will be conducted by uh, John MacDonald and it will be on the subject of cancel culture. That will be at the same time, uh, starting at six o'clock next Tuesday. So thanking you all and thanking our speaker once again. I bid you all good night. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Matt.